Hello everyone, and welcome to this mini lecture on feminism in popular culture. And what we want to first start off with is having this discussion of what is feminism. Uh, it gets a lot of slack in contemporary society, which is awfully, often very confusing or I find very problematic given what it is and how at its basic tenet it, would, it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, it's not... I think it gets a lot of misrepresentation, and that typically misrepresentation comes from uh, conservative pundits, conservative, you know, far rightward conservatives that attempt to malign it in a way that just isn't what it is. At its core, uh, feminism is an approach that examines the inequalities of sexes, believing that largely that their differences are culturally and socially constructed. That is, there are some differences between men and women, or males and females, but to the degree in which males and females are separated and deemed different in our culture, uh, much of that is culturally and socially constructed. And there's a lot of research that reinforces this, that says, you know, we we program our culture often, or we reinforce the cultural norm that boys are one way, girls are another, males are one way, females are another. I mean, when we talk about sex, we're, we're clearly talking about what role somebody has in reproduction. But that that but that that all of a sudden becomes extrapolated into decisions around you know males should do this, fe you know males should always ask. Uh, females out on a date, or females should always be, you know, this or that. Those are things that are largely culturally and socially cons constructed. And so within popular culture, we want to look at the ways in which women are dealt with, shaped, and represented. Uh, I would also add increasingly the ways in which they attempt to represent and renegotiate themselves having through feminism gained a lot more cultural power uh, over the last 30 or 40 years. So we have a couple different major approaches or feminist theories of popular culture. Uh, the first is liberal feminism and this would be an approach uh, or this would be the argument of unequal representation in media or popular culture and so the goal would be to have equal representation and what do we mean by equal representation well if we look at population we know that 51 percent of the population is female and so within popular culture within media that should mean that 51 percent representation is there. So in films you should see at least half of those films having a strong female protagonist or to be uh, having a female lead or, or do something. You know, in the news you should have half of your anchors or 51 percent of your anchors should be female. Politicians, sh you know, when we look at who's in Congress, how many presidents we've had, there should be equal representation. It should not just be what it has been historically overwhelmingly male. Then we have radical feminism and within radical feminism and this is where certainly there gets to be some challenges uh, or this is where a lot of people end up being really concerned or, or we get you know we hear that term radical and all of a sudden think well radical. And Radical feminism sees that culture is purposely structured to present negative images of females to maintain the, the patriarchy. We see high culture is the equivalent of mas masculine culture and popular culture is the equivalent of female, uh, is the equivalent of, of the feminine. And within this, that there is this idea of, and we, we can think about it, uh, you know, when we look at high culture and again, how many of them are overwhelmingly male? Uh, of you know the, the supposed great artists and the great other you know the great actors and the great you know these are considered male or high culture is seen as something that is dignified through you know male behavior right a good example go to a museum the proper behavior is to be quiet and respectful you aren't supposed to talk and talking is something that we often in our culture privileged females. We say, you know, women are so chatty. So 
we see these kind of dynamics or within radical feminism they say that you know we have a culture that has purposely uh, you know is purposely structured to disempower females and that that needs to be renegotiated or uh, reoriented and then we have socialist feminism, and this understands that media construction is situated within other social dynamics such as class and race. And I think this is an interesting one because in social feminism, you know, they recognize some of the things we see in liberal and radical feminism, but they're also aware of there are these other aspects to be, you know, to take into consideration. Class and race are major elements within all of, uh, w within anything within popular culture. And so we have feminism, socialist feminism, really taking that into account and really trying to speak to those pieces as well. And of course, you know, it's socialist feminism, feminism that's why it does speak up uh, to class. And of course, in, in the last hundred years, also be understanding that uh, or in the last 100 years, the last, uh, you know, 30 years, 40 years, also understanding that race is also c interconnected with that. All right. So we have um, some hypothesis or some ways of, of understanding what's going on with with feminism or, or feminist approaches to thinking about popular culture. And one is the reflection hypothesis. And this hypothesis it essentially says media perpetuates the dominant social values in our culture, often through symbolic representation, how we want to see ourselves. They do this in part to attract audiences through lowest common denominator, shared values and amusements. And so within that, within that reflection hypothesis, the argument would be if we had more you know, more a, a larger representation of females in popular culture, throughout popular culture. Artists, writers, creators, protagonists, uh, this would actually, or this should improve or, or help us recognize, you know, what we want to see in ourselves or, or improve understanding and appreciation of females more than what it has in the past. We also see content analysis, and this is actually extrapolating the elements of a piece of media to measure how much of something is represented. So here we might look at, you know, just how many women are anchor people on all the news stations in the country. How many films in the last year had strong female leads, had females who were not just, you know, were not represented in a sexist fashion, were not required to show themselves or you know to reveal their bodies while their male counterparts in the film didn't have to right so we're really looking at and kind of finding out exactly how much um, how much is there to recognize those differences but there is that question of does presence of a trend constitute a truth and this is of course causation versus correlation um, and we see that with violence right so uh, if we if we see there's more viol if we do see there's more violence on TV, uh, does that actually represent something, or is that cause you know is it cause and effect, or is it correlation? Are there people just more violent, and so therefore we want to see more violence on TV? Similarly, with with females, you know, does more representation of females actually constitute a truth? Does it constitute something has changed, and does it have any real world effect? And then we have interpretive analysis, and here's the, you know what, what goes on is exploring the under the underlying meanings and ideas not overtly present within a piece of popular culture, making sense of its subtext. That is using things like sub semiology and, and structuralism to really take apart what's going on in a particular film and or a you know a particular piece of popular culture, a film, a comic, what have you. There's a so with an interpretive analysis, you're sitting down with one piece, and you're real. In one piece, when I say one piece, that could be the entire run of a TV show, right? That's technically one piece, or it could be one episode. And you're really taking apart how the ideas within that piece of popular culture are being explored. So reflection hypothesis, content analysis, interpretive analysis. We're talking about all of these with relation to feminism, but these are things you could do with other types of identity and concepts in in popular culture or anywhere for that matter 
But what we do see, or what, what's been argued uh, within feminism that's important to, to recognize is what we call the symbolic annihilation of women. And this is that patriarchs, the patriarchal culture attempts to limit and lessen the powers, abilities, and agencies of women through limited, mis limited representation. That is, by limiting what roles they can be, by limiting you know, where they show up in popular culture, there's the symbolic annihilation of women. And so women don't see themselves in roles of power, don't see themselves out there in culture in significant ways. And there is a question of, does that then limit the hopes, aspirations, or potentials for females? And does that just reinforce the patriarchal structure? Uh, there is some really interesting research around this and, and views of this. If you ever have a chance, I'd recommend the book Big Girls Don't Cry. Uh, and I can't remember the author f of it right now off the top of my head, but the, the book really does look at how this happened or you know the ways in which females were attacked in the 2008 uh, presidential election when you have both uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, Sarah Palin, regardless of what, you know what you think of their politics were, were were brutally attacked for things beyond what you know the the male contenders were attacked for things that trivialize them as women and so i think this idea of symbolic annihilation is is a very important one that still lingers in our culture today and finally, we talked about this earlier in the semester when we talked about um, gender, sex, and sexuality, but it's worth mentioning again this idea of the gaze in popular culture by Laura Mulvey. And the idea, I mean, again, we still see it, although I would say it's much more dynamic nowadays, and, and that's not to say it's gone away, but we still we see a more multiple viewing of it, I guess. We have, we have more than one gaze. Um, but this was, you know, in many cultural products, men are meant to be the lookers, viewers, and gazers, while females are to be the object of the gaze. This too is also said to have shaped how we act and conceive of ourselves. That what we see throughout popular culture is this exhibition of women to be looked at, to be objects, and men to be agents, right? So, the, you know, if you're ever watching an older film, you'll see the, the camera will look it will will peer on the man and the man is looking and then the camera will cut to the woman and give you a long you know follow the trail up and down the body of the woman to show you she's meant to be looked at and this is certainly true when we look at our culture in the ways in which men and women present themselves out in culture uh, out in society that is women are encouraged to and even in certain jobs required to dress up to a certain degree to present themselves as viewable this entails makeup this entails you know uh, wearing things like heels and skirts and a variety of you know accoutrements that are to make them presented to be seen whereas men there's often a lot more leeway there's often a lot less uh, attention to their to their attire actually a good example would be something like the prom where all of the men can be or you know all of the men can be dressed in the same tuxedo nobody will care but with the women, the expectation is that they're all wearing different dresses. And so that tells you a little bit about the women are supposed to be looked at, whereas the males are decoration, as it were. All right, so I'm going to just do two examples here that I, w I think are worth, you know, kind of thinking about within this. Uh, the first is cookbooks. This might be less so nowadays uh, in the last, I would say, five to ten years because We've had the rise of the foodie movement, which you know has a mixture of people involved. But we, ca if you look historically, and you could probably still see it, if you go into you know the 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 food section of a bookstore and look at cookbook covers, how many of them are female and how many of them are male? And if they are male, are they designated as chefs? Do they have chef attire? or are they domestically placed? If we look here, we see all of these females and they are largely in the kitchen, right? So this this is, you know, looking at, this is using a feminist analysis to say, well, what's up with that? You know, and even in, um, you know, tested Crisco recipes, you have that, 
looks like a mother and daughter. So you have this indoctrination going on where a mother is, you know, trying to teach the daughter. And I think this is an, just an interesting thing to be aware of is just all the ways in which we would reinforce gender, even through something like cookbook covers. Uh, I also like would like to go over to, of course, magazine and comic covers and, you know, just look very briefly and what's going on in all of these. In all of these covers, the women are in some way either being saved or being threatened and needing to be saved, right? And, you know, this was just a handful that I, that I grabbed. If you looked at, you could find thousands of comic book covers that in in pulp magazine covers that reinforce this imagery that you know speak to women as victims and men at needing you know needing to save them so this is just kind of an introduction to be thinking about feminism and in the ways in which it works or can help us study or understand or think about popular culture um, thank you very much for watching and see you in the next lecture